Um, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, a technique called reduced order quadratures, which can be used to compress gravitational wave uh, likelihood evaluations. So this work has been going on for, for quite some time. So in some sense, the, the talk is a summary of many of the papers that are shown here. Um, the first set of papers, maybe up till 2015 or so, was kind of developing the framework for this approach. Uh, many kind of proof of concept type papers and developing a lot of the methodology. Uh, and then over the past few years, we've been sort of applying this tool to increasingly more complicated uh, problems and detectors. Uh, so I'll try to summarize that uh, a bit as well. But in keeping with the theme today, the focus is really going to be on the methodology uh, a bit. Uh, so the introduction, uh, I mean, many of these slides we've seen before, so I guess they're, they're kind of here just to fix uh, notation to some extent. Um, so we assume we have a gravitational wave signal in our detector. Uh, so the detector data will be given by D. Uh, the gravitational wave uh, is, is H, and here's the noise here. Uh, so here's a little cartoon of what this might, might look like, where we have very noisy data and then some signal buried in there. But fortunately, the detection pipelines have, have told us there's a signal in our data, so really the job here uh, for us is, is parameter estimation. Um, so the, the infant problem, we've heard about this many times. I mean, that's really what the workshop is about, trying to characterize the properties of the, of the signal uh, that we're seeing, the masses, the spins, the sky location, and so on. So uh, again, kind of keeping with the tradition of all the talks, I throw up the kind of obligatory Bayes theorem uh, slide. So here's the inference problem for gravitational waves. Uh, so we assume some model is maybe given by GR or some approximation to GR. Uh, and it's described by, uh, in the case of binary black hole systems, a 15 dimensional parameter vector, which includes things like the extrinsic parameters and so on. And uh, really the goal of the parameter estimation problem is to compute this posterior distribution here on the left. So the probability of uh, the signal that you've observed being described with some parameters. Uh, so that's what you would like to compute. And the thing that you need to, uh, uh, to make this computation involves these three factors. Uh, for the purpose of our story, really the only thing that we're gonna be focusing on here uh, is the likelihood function, which uh, I mean, Stephen Green's excellent talk just kind of showed us that maybe we actually don't need the, maybe the days are numbered <laughs> for the likelihood function. Um, so at least for now, most of the, the pipelines do use likelihood function based approaches, but maybe this, this story will be changing quickly in the future. Um, but for now, if we're gonna be uh, computing things using a likelihood function, uh, here it is here in this box. So I, actually in Tyson's talk uh, on Monday, I think it was, it was described that there are many assumptions going into this, this model. So the, the noise is Gaussian, it's stationary, uh, it's the simplest possible setting. Uh, but assuming all of these things, we can write down an explicit, explicit expression for the likelihood function. So uh, previous two slides ago, there was the detector as a function of time, but now we've Fourier transformed it. So we're working in frequencies. Uh, these are given at equally spaced points on a frequency grid. And uh, this is the thing that we have to compute over and over again inside this exponential here. Um, so the thing that's really costly is actually the term that on the top, that's the numerator, which we'll be talking quite a bit about. And the denominator, this is some experimentally measured variance, uh, power spectral density, which comes from uh, the detector's uh, characteristics of the noise while it's observing over some time window. So these computations are slow, and this is kind of a, a simple back of the envelope calculation to show how the cost can really escalate when you're doing things like evaluating likelihood functions many times. So assuming we have a lightning fast model, uh, I don't know if current best state of the art models can achieve this, but if it was 10 to the minus six seconds to evaluate your model, uh, which is given here, this, this H at one value of frequency and one parameter point, then how would this cost escalate through a full PE run, well, if you had a long BNS signal, um, maybe sampled at uh, 4096, and maybe there's 64 seconds of data, so these are somewhat aggressive settings, but uh, just for the sake of this, this simple calculation here, and then maybe a typical PE run takes 10 to the 6 likelihood evaluations, um, adding up all of, well, multiplying all of these numbers uh, implies roughly three days of, of runtime if you're just doing a sequential MCMC. Uh, which people don't do, but uh, that's how long it would take if, if one were doing that. And these numbers are definitely subject to change. So, I mean, this number 10 to the six could easily be 10 to the seven. Um, and typically the models are not this fast. Uh, so it's somewhat of a best case scenario, but this kind of shows how the cost can, can escalate quickly. So depending on the problem, I mean, this can range from just frustratingly slow in the sense that you may have to wait many days for, for your 
results come back to something where you just can't do the problem uh, at all. It's prohibitively slow. So for example, uh, near the end of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about trying to analyze binary neutron star signals with third generation detectors. Uh, this would take hundreds or thousands of years to complete, uh, which no one has done. So that's obviously a ballpark estimate, but just based on the cost of evaluating a likelihood, and then also the number of likelihood evaluations you would need, that's roughly how long it would take. Uh, in practice for LIGO, it really depends some, a lot on the model. So uh, if you're using a closed form kind of frequency domain model, this could take days. Uh, but if you're using ODE models like SEOB or uh, P PDE models like, like NR, which you really can't do directly, uh, this could take months, or in the case of NR, really can't be done in any direct, direct method. So given the importance of this problem, there's been many approaches to speeding things up. Uh, so this is by no means an exhaustive list because there are just many techniques that have appeared in the literature, but roughly speaking, they fall into these broad categories. So one approach is to make the waveform model faster. So uh, there are many examples of this. In fact, like the Phenom model of uh, waveform model family is, is one approach to making model evaluations faster because it's given in the frequency domain uh, by closed form expressions. And um, surrogate models, recently they've been looking at feed forward kind of deep neural network models. These are all approaches to speeding up the model computation. Uh, other techniques could be make the sampling faster. So there's a talk later today about scalable inference. Uh, parallelized nested sampling with PBuild are approaches to, to kind of solving the problem with this, with this kind of framework. Uh, the likelihood free methods by, I mean, Stephen Green's talk, which was, was, was excellent um, in some sense, that's if you don't have a likelihood, it doesn't cost anything uh, and you can get your posteriors in order of seconds. Uh, reduced order quadratures falls into this category where we, we try to make the likelihood evaluation faster. Uh, other techniques that do this are multiband uh, interpolation, uh, another technique called relative bidding uh, also does the same thing. And finally, using better, better hardware, uh, for example, Rift, which is uh, this code um, that does some of the, the flagship PE for, for, for LIGO, uh, has a GPU acceleration kind of module built in for carrying out some of the Monte Carlo integrals. Uh, and oftentimes, you would want to use a combination of these approaches to make things really as fast as possible. So reduced order quadratures, which is the focus of this talk, uh, has been around for a while and it's been used in some science that's been that's been done. Uh, so here I've just listed a couple of events that I'm aware of that used reduced order quadratures uh, kind of in the, the official analysis um, and has, was oftentimes the first kind of low latency results uh, that helped produce uh, some of the first look at like posteriors, for example. Um, so some benefits is uh, it's very fast. There are no issues with non-Gaussian or large noise sources other than the likelihood assumption. So if the noise is non-Gaussian, the likelihood assumption doesn't strictly speaking hold. But if you're going to be evaluating the likelihood using reduced order quadratures, uh, non-Gaussian entities, for example, won't bring in any additional problems. Uh, reduced order quadratures are already available in many of the flagship codes that produce posterior samples, law inference, Bilby, parallel Bilby. And there are many drawbacks as well, which we'll come to near the end of the talk when I'm trying to discuss uh, what's next for uh, this, this, this methodology. Okay, so um, most of the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we'll be talking about what reduced order quadratures are. Just to say, how are they built? What's their framework? And what can we say about the, the error that we make when we go about computing a likelihood uh, with reduced order quadratures? So uh, the first thing to kind of point out is, uh, well, what are quadratures and what makes a quadrature rule good versus bad? Um, so uh, if someone gave you a function f of t to integrate on a computer, uh, you would need some quadrature rule. And this would require you to know two things. You would have to know the points to sample the function at. Uh, these are sometimes called nodes or in quadrature points. Uh, this is t sub k. And you would have to know weights, uh, these omega k's. And if you knew these two things, if you could sample your function, you could uh, build up the sum, and that would be some approximation uh, for the integral. And you could go about measuring the error using this formula here. So uh, there's kind of two extremes to quadrature rules. So there are, there are low order quadrature rules. So one uh, prime example is just the Riemann sum, which is very essentially what is used in kind of the default likelihood, log likelihood uh, computations um, that are done. So if you're given an equally spaced grid of points, so zero, delta t, two delta t, and so on, and your omegas, your weights are delta t, uh, this quadrature rule will converge 
like n to the minus one. So if you were to plot this on a log log scale, n here is the kind of the number of function evaluations, the y axis is the error. Um, here's the Riemann sum line, it's going down very slowly, it's converging very slowly to the true answer uh, because it's a low order rule. And the other extreme, uh, high order or spectrally accurate quadrature rules, one example being Gaussian quadratures, uh, the weights and the, the, the values T, T of K are very special. Uh, these T of Ks, for example, in Gaussian quadratures, they tend to cluster near the boundaries of the integral you're, you're integrating over. Uh, so they definitely don't come, for example, I mean, the detector LIGO does not sample at Gaussian quadrature points. But uh, if you could evaluate your function at these special points and get these special weights and your function were smooth, uh, then your error, how quickly you could you converge to the true answer, would converge exponentially fast. Uh, and that's shown here on this other plot, uh, this other line, where uh, the error is just quickly plummeting. I mean, this is my attempt at drawing 10 to the minus 3. It's supposed to be 10 to the minus 5, so that's the error. So it's converging spectrally fast towards the true solution. So uh, for noisy data, the question is, can we develop a high order quadrature rule uh, in this context? At, at first glance, this would seem to be no, because the function's not smooth, we have noisy data. Um, okay, so first this, this notation here, these brackets are just uh, inner products between two vectors. And here we're splitting up our, uh, this is the likelihood that we have to compute into three separate terms. Uh, so this first term here, this is the data inner product with itself. Uh, that's not a parameter dependent uh, term, so you just can compute that once. Um, these other two terms in blue, because they feature the model, uh, here we have the inner product of the model with itself, and here's the inner product of the model with the data, uh, sometimes called the overlap uh, integral. The model, if it's smooth, which it, which it typically is, uh, in some sense has to be, uh, we may have chosen a high order Gaussian quadrature-like quadrature rule, uh, if we didn't know that there was data kind of lurking around. Um, so the remainder of this talk is to try to convince you we can build Gaussian quadrature-like quadrature rules for uh, terms like these two that are, are smooth. So uh, here's really the goal. So um, just focusing on, notice here there are, th are three terms. We're just going to really focus on uh, the last one, the most interesting one. So the overlap between the data and the model. Uh, so that's just given by this expression again. What we're hoping to do is replace it by another sum uh, over evaluations of the model, but not at the original frequency points, at a subset, uh, you're selecting from the full set of discretely sampled frequencies, uh, a subset of points. And these weights here are, um, they're data dependent weights. So they're kind of like, I mean, they're very much like the weights in the Gaussian quadrature case, but now they depend on the data. Uh, and that's the reduced order quadrature rule that we're after. Um, the reason why this should be a good way of computing uh, these, these terms that are, arise, like the, uh, the data overlap with the, with the model, is capital N, which features in this summation, that's a property of the detector. Um, how is it observing uh, the signal? Whereas this lowercase n here, this is a property of the model. This is how much we can compress the model space into a compact subspace. Uh, and these two numbers need not be related to one another. Um, okay, so here is sort of the steps for this. Uh, so this calligraphic F here won't appear too much in the talk, but it helps streamline some of the equations that are coming next. So this is basically just saying we have a set of functions, our parameterized model. Um, so really just, it's probably better to just think of a concrete example. Um, our functions may be uh, from defined on 20 Hertz to 4096. And um, this parameter domain here, we have to choose masses and spins. Uh, maybe we're looking at binary neutron stars, so the masses are, are quite small, maybe one to three solar masses or something. Um, once we've made these choices, we've defined this set of functions, and we have a couple of things we need to do. Uh, the first thing we need to do is, is actually very much related to one of the parts, and uh, I guess it was called the, I think it was the compression kind of step of, of Stevens neural network where you want to find a linear subspace representing the data. Um, so that's kind of step one for us as well. Uh, the next thing we want to do is write down um, kind of a way to integrate functions that live in this subspace. And once we've done these two things, that's kind of this offline work, uh, which is computationally intensive, but you save this information to a file. And then when some data comes in, you can go and compute these quadrature weights kind of as a startup cost. And now you use the new quadrature rule, which has many, many uh, fewer function evaluations of the, of the model, these capital Fs, 
instead of the original quadrature rule that you were going to use previously. That's where the savings comes in. So the compressing the model step, um, basically what we're after is to represent any uh, gravitational uh, wave model valuation, so this, this, this H here, uh, as a linear combination of uh, basis functions. So if you have an approximation space, this is typically what you're thinking of, trying to approximate your function as a linear combination of a basis that span this approximation space. Uh, this is generically called the reduced order model. And um, th I mean, this term gets used a lot in different contexts, but if you hear the term reduced order model, usually there's a compression step like this. Uh, what's special about these bases is that they're very much tailored to the model. So they're considered are oftentimes called application specific bases. So they're not, for example, sines or cosines or polynomials or any of the classical basis functions or wavelets that you may run into. And uh, we're kind of looking for the optimal compression. So what is the best approximation space, which is to say we want this lowercase uh, n here to be as small as possible. Once we find this approximation space, we'll choose our basis to span this space, and then we'll go on to step two. Uh, there's actually a framework for answering that question, what is the best approximation space, um, goes by the name Kolmogorov n-width problem. So this uh, n-width thing is basically, it's a, it's a quantity, it's a number, and it's trying to solve an optimization problem. So the optimization is given by this outer step. So you're looking for, you maybe, for example, you fix lowercase n, you're saying I want a 10-dimensional space. Uh, you're searching for all possible 10-dimensional spaces uh, such that, um, so you, this is this min over here, such that the worst error, so the, here's your approximation of the gravitational wave in the space. Uh, the worst approximation uh, is something that you're trying to make as small as possible by solving the minimization problem. Uh, unfortunately, so that's the statement of the problem. It's just kind of pointing out what we want. Uh, you can't solve <laughs> the n-width problem. Uh, in general. So you need another way of doing this. And uh, there's something called the greedy method, which comes to uh, the rescue here. So kind of the, the cartoon steps for, for doing this is as follows. So we start with our set of functions that we, we had before. So this is calligraphic uh, F thing. And this is a continuum. It's all filled in. Uh, the first step is to discretize it. So we have to sample this continuum of functions that's given by these light gray circles here. Uh, this is oftentimes referred to as the training space. And then we start going about searching for the best uh, this approximation space uh, Xn using this greedy method. So the first thing we have to do is initialize. So we randomly select some point, uh, sometimes called the seed. Uh, it turns out that it, the resulting space that we find is insensitive to the seed choice, uh, but we just have to pick something. And that gives us one basis function. Essentially, we uh, normalize in this case because it's just one uh, thing picked, we normalize our, our waveform uh, and call it EI, so it spans a one-dimensional space. And then we search through the training set looking for uh, the parameter whose waveform is uh, most poorly described by this one basis function. So we ask how well can we represent, for example, this mu2 with this basis function E1. Uh, there's some worse one in the training set, and we pick that one to be the next uh, basis function, and now we have a two-dimensional space. Uh, so this is a very simple procedure. Uh, it's just marching through the training set and just hierarchically building up your approximation space. Uh, but it has some uh, powerful theory behind it. Um, so in the sense that you, if you knew what the Kolmogorov n with was, if you could compute that space and compute the approximation value, the greedy algorithm that I just described has very similar approximation values given by this statement here. Um, so for example, if the n width decayed exponentially fast. So for let's just set these constants to one, so e to the minus n say. Um, that's if you have a nice smooth model, that's great because it means as you add, as you make the dimension of your approximation space bigger, uh, you can approximate the waveforms uh, exponentially well, um, just for a small value of, of n. The greedy error is given by a similar bound. So there's these factors of square root two c and so on, but notice that we have e to the minus and up here as well. So the greedy error, the approximation power of, of the space that you get with the greedy algorithm is very comparable to the approximation you would get if you could solve the Kolmogorov uh, n with uh, case. So it's nearly optimal. And uh, in practice, this is really a numerical linear algebra problem like most things are. Uh, so if you were viewing your training set as a matrix where the uh, columns were uh, samples of the parameter values, the masses and spins, and the rows were 
uh, frequencies. This is an n by k matrix, and what the greedy algorithm does, it selects it. Sometimes I mean, it goes under other names in other communities. Sometimes it's called column subset selection. Uh, it selects the n columns from A which serve as the best low rank approximation. That's that's kind of what it's doing. So, as an example, if we had a um, it's a, a effective one body waveform, just the two two mode. Uh, this is just over a small region of parameter space, and we ran this greedy algorithm on it. What would we get? So the main thing is in this lower right-hand corner here, um, the number of uh, points selected from the, from the training set. So this is also the dimension of the approximation space. And on the y-axis, this is the greedy error. So this is, uh, you can see this is semi-log y. So the errors are going down very quickly as you add more and more basis functions into your approximation space. Uh, so this was done with the greedy algorithm, but similar kind of trends can be observed with SVD and POD. Um, so they're, they're all kind of exploiting the same property of the model, which is to say that it's smooth. And what these basis functions look like, so here are the first uh, six for the EOB model. So basis function two, remember that is orthogonalized with respect to basis function one, which is a waveform. So this isn't quite a waveform, it's because we've orthogonalized it, but it kind of looks like it. Um, and if we ask, well, how well could we represent mass ratio waveform one point? 2040 using two bases. Um, so we'd have two, two numbers to compute, C1 and C2. Uh, the error is pretty bad. It's, it's basically order one. But by the time we've computed six basis functions, um, now the error is 10 to the minus six. So we really only need six degrees of freedom, six numbers to represent our, our waveform. Um, so that's really where the power of the method comes in, because this means for quadrature rules, you'd only have to evaluate the likelihood at six frequencies it will turn out. Um, okay, so a summary of step one. Um, so we define what kind of model we want to uh, approximate, and we go about trying to find the best approximation space, uh, n-dimensional approximation space. Uh, we can't do that, so we use this greedy algorithm to do it for us, and we can compute the error. This is the greedy error. Um, and this error decays exponentially fast if the model is smooth, and that is because the end width should also decay exponentially fast for smooth models. So this is kind of step one, getting the basis functions or doing the model compression step. So step two is we need to integrate in this approximation space uh, Xn. So for that, we, we're actually gonna first think of trying to interpolate in this space, and then we'll derive something called an interpolatory quadrature rule. Uh, so we have some restrictions. So we, we really wanna sample our points as a subset of the equally spaced frequency values that the detector is giving to us. And we also just, I mean, to point out, we can't just randomly select points or pick uniform space points or something. Uh, that will lead to a poorly conditioned problem, which is to say the errors will be extremely large when you go about trying to compute these, uh, these likelihoods using reduced order quadratures. So uh, picking these points is, um, there's many ways of doing it, but uh, one really good method is called the empirical interpolation method. This was uh, proposed in early as 2004 and was kind of extended. We're basically using the 2009 version. Um, so the input to this yet another greedy algorithm are your basis functions. And the output are the best points for interpolating with these basis functions. So if there are n basis functions coming in, there are going to be n frequencies uh, values coming out. And these are very much adapted to the problem. So for example, if you're familiar with polynomial interpolation, you would say, okay, the best thing I can do is use Chebyshev nodes. Those are uh, basically uh, overly sampled the boundaries, the interior is sparsely sampled. Uh, that's not what our, our points are going to look like. And this is again, kind of an, an iterative procedure. Uh, it's a greedy algorithm that kind of sequentially selects points. So we start with one point, we extend it and get our second point uh, and so on and so forth. So it's probably best to just look at this as an example. So Imagine for the sake of just trying to understand what the empirical interpolation algorithm is doing, we're trying to find good points for polynomial interpolation on the interval minus one to one. Um, so in this case, I, as I already mentioned, we know what the best points are. We're just trying to uh, check to see what the algorithm gives us in this more simple setting. So our basis functions, we're free to choose them. So let's choose them to be just the Legendre polynomials on minus one to one. Uh, the first six of them are shown here in this figure. Um, so what points do we get? And how is the algorithm picking points for us with these basis functions? So it's, it's iterative, so it starts at the very first basis function. So the first basis function is just a constant one over square root two. Uh, it's given by this black line here. 
And the way the method works is it asks, how well can I represent this basis function one over square root two, uh, in this case, using zero, because we don't, we don't actually have anything yet. We, we're starting with our very first basis function. Um, the residual is just P zero minus zero. And we look for the maximum point over our domain X. So there's no preference. So we can pick it wherever we want. So we just decide to pick arbitrarily the middle of the interval and we have zero. Okay, so the next point uh, we need to select is a point that will uh, associate with basis function one. Uh, so the next basis function uh, is square root three over two X. And uh, the way that we go about looking, finding the residual here is we take this P1 and subtract off um, effectively speaking how P1 projects on to P0 in kind of like an interpolatory sense. Um, so that's given by here. So we have to find this C0, but there's ways to do that. Uh, turns out in this case, uh, C0 is zero. So the residual is just square root of three divided by two times X. And the residual is exactly the same as P1. Um, so now the maximum, so there's only two choices that we can pick. So we're trying to find where the residual is largest. Uh, it's either minus one or one. So we can pick either one. Uh, we arbitrarily pick minus one here. And just the last one here, so this one gives somewhat a uh, non-trivial uh, residual. So basis function two uh, is given by this polynomial here. And our residual, we're asking how well can we represent P2 with a linear combination of P0 and P1, but in an interpolation sense using the basis functions P1 and P0 and these two points. Uh, we go about computing the residual and that's given by this dashed blue line. And now the maximum is a unique point. It's up here at value x equal to one. We found our first three points. Um, we can continue for the first 24 points and just ask how well do these points agree with the Chebyshev nodes. Uh, they're not exactly the same, but the thing that's interesting to note, um, maybe interesting is a, a relative term here, but they do cluster towards the boundaries just like the Chebyshev nodes do. Uh, so they have similar distribution and approximation properties, it turns out, uh, as the Chebyshev nodes for polynomials. So um, an interpolant is you both have basis functions and points, and they are an equal number. And the empirical interpolant, now that we know our basis functions and our points, can be written down by this expression in the box here. Um, but the key thing is that the lowercase n is much smaller than the data's length. That's where the approximation uh, properties will help reduce the cost of uh, evaluating the likelihood. And now we're ready to finally form the reduced order quadrature rule. So uh, coming back to the original overlap that we needed to compute, that's this expression here. Uh, the only approximation we make is substituting in the gravitational waveform H for its empirical interpolant. So just substituting this formula uh, into this slot here and then kind of reworking the terms um, to get it to look like this expression. So these weights, for example, are effectively overlaps or correlations between the data and the basis functions, say. That's kind of how they arise. Um, and, and that's essentially it. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that there are well-defined error bounds for this, for this setup. So uh, if you want to know how good are you approximating uh, the overlap, that's uh, D overlap with H with the reduced order quadrature approximation, uh, you know ahead of time exactly what that is. It's the, it's the error in, a, in, in the basis, so this greedy error, times this other term here, which is computable. Uh, it's the norm of the interpolation operator, which you can compute in one line with, with Python because uh, this is effectively represented as a matrix. So both of these numbers are computable and uh, you know ahead of time how good of an approximation job you'll be doing. So you don't actually have to, to, to check. You don't have to run PE, end to end PE runs to check, you know ahead of time. Um, okay, so for the remainder, I guess 15 minutes or so, I'll just sort of briefly talk about different places where reduced order quadratures have been used to accelerate parameter estimation. Uh, the first thing to point out is that uh, this is somewhat of a drawback is you have to decide on all of the settings ahead of time. So what's your model? Uh, what's the detector sampling rate, the F-low and the F-max, the parameter domain? Uh, but once you've done all that, you can go about computing the basis using the greedy algorithm and the interpolation nodes using the empirical interpolation uh, framework. Save that to an HDF5 file. And then when data comes in, uh, you load in the HDF5 file and compute the reduced order quadrature weights and then you're kind of ready to go. So at least to my knowledge, these are the models where reduced order quadrature rules have been built for. Um, so Phenom PV2, uh, this was done in 2016. 
Uh, in 2018, there were there was Phenom PV2 with uh, kind of non-GR deviations. And there have been a number of unpublished uh, RQ rules also produced, which my understanding is this these are used within within LIGO, but I'm I'm not in LIGO, so I don't I don't actually know that to be true. <laughs> um, but there are these other models here. Um, detectors, so most of the reduced order quantity rules built to date have been focused on the current generation of detectors. Uh, very recently in 2021, Rory Smith and collaborators uh, looked at future detectors, BNS signals with, with uh, uh, Cosmic Explorer and the Einstein telescope. And future ongoing work with current ground-based detectors, uh, my understanding is there's some efforts to get Phenom PX, uh, XPHM, I have an ROQ rule for that beyond GR extensions for, for kind of more phenom families and this title model as well. Uh, so I believe this is being carried out by Carl, Michael, Rory, and, and maybe some others as well. Uh, using ROQ, so um, there's, I mean, all of the kind of the flagship samplers, LAL inference, Bilby, parallel Bilby, have an ROQ interface. So you can automatically, you, once you've computed your ROQ data, you can use them uh, within, a, within an end-to-end -end PE run. And the data sets are stored somewhere. I believe this is one place they're, they're stored in this ROQ underscore data uh, directory. Um, and the data is basic, it's just the basis and the nodes that we already saw. Uh, so nothing too exciting here. One thing to point out is computing these, even though it's an offline cost, um, it doesn't mean it's free. It, it really uh, does take a, quite a lot of uh, computational effort to build reduced order quadratures. Um, so there's been a lot of work in developing highly efficient and parallelized codes for this task. So uh, one code I'm familiar with is this greedy CPP code, and uh, that implements all sorts of things to try to tackle the most challenging problems. Um, so for example, it's highly parallelized um, across nodes and also uh, threads. Uh, it uses a variety of tricks, for example, this fast EIM algorithm uh, to handle very, very large problems. Uh, and you have to use various kind of uh, numerical linear algebra tricks from the 80s to keep your basis functions uh, from becoming uh, uh, ill-conditioned. And also this code, the greedy CPP code, kind of has things in place to quickly export your data into a format that can be used by law inference or building. Uh, I'll point out that there are alternative codes. Uh, one is a pure Python code uh, that's listed here. And I even found this law inference generator ROQ code that's within uh, the law suit. So I, I haven't used these myself, but uh, these are alternatives that are available. Uh, the greedy CPP code, we very often have to build ROQs using many, many hundreds or thousands of cores. So we have to be very concerned with the scaling of the problem. Uh, so here are the number of cores we're using. Um, and here's time in seconds. And this is just a, a simple scaling test uh, where we scale up the training set. So the training set here uh, from the greedy algorithm that I showed previously, in this case, it's uh, 100 times the number of cores. This is a weak scaling test. And we let the cores go from 32 all the way up to 32,000. Uh, so these are very large matrices or problems that we're doing dimensionality uh, reduction on. Uh, Runtime doesn't change that much. So the matrix that has, uh, I don't know, roughly 3,000 columns here, and this one has well, a lot more, uh, I guess 3 million or so, roughly the runtime to, to, to compress these matrices is effectively the same because of parallelization. Um, okay, so for Phenom V2, uh, this work was done in, in 2016. Uh, so this uses this model by Hanneman Schmidt et al. And uh, it's, a, it's a processing model that uses a carrier aligned wave form kind of uh, underlying model that uses the 2-2 mode. But the Phenom P model and the twist up approach also includes the 2-2, the, the 2-1, and the 2-0. And uh, this was the first processing ROQ rule that was built. Uh, it was built in for different chunks in the parameter space. So for example, uh, neutron stars, which would be down here for this case F, they're much longer and they need to be sampled much more densely. Um, then for example, case A, which would be kind of a black hole case uh, where the waveform duration is maybe only a couple of seconds and you can get away with a smaller effective uh, delta F. Uh, so we built our accues in different bands. And uh, one of the steps we need to keep in mind, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, not too much time left. Um, so yeah, so this case here, I mean, just to give you a sense of the, the challenge. So we, this model is seven dimensional kind of in the intrinsic model space. Uh, the mass parameters, we sample uh, 64 points in both math, mass directions and the spins uh, eight points in each of the spin directions. So this is a huge matrix. Uh, there's over a hundred million columns 
many, many terabytes in, in memory. And we need to compress this matrix as part of that first, first greedy algorithm step. But you can see here, despite the matrix being uh, enormous, that basically the compression is, is fairly remarkable. I mean, you really only need, depending on your, what, how accurate you want to go. So we, we often run our code to 10 to the minus 11 or so, which is admittedly overkill. Uh, but if you were happy with 10 to the minus four relative error, you would need roughly 100 basis functions to, to kind of span this entire uh, BNS space. Um, the second step of picking the ROQ nodes, uh, that's again, you can kind of think of this as like a very tailored kind of downsampling strategy. So this kind of shows the fraction of points that... Oh, sorry, sorry, is it back? Okay, great, sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this step because I think I'm running short on time. So basically the idea is a signal comes in, we have our basis functions. Uh, so we, with that, we can compute our data dependent weights um, and we can go about doing a full end-to-end -end PE run. So here's an example here using uh, some just mock data. Uh, and you can kind of just see by comparing the full and the reduced order quadrature values that the, the medians and the confidence limits, they're all uh, consistent in the, I mean, they're identical, better than uh, consistent. And uh, as I'll point out as something I mentioned earlier, this is actually more of a sanity test of the code, how well it's implemented the algorithm, because uh, we're guaranteed from those error estimates that the accuracy will be preserved, uh, especially if we're doing our approximations to 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 12 or so. Um, so given that they're the same result, how much faster? This depends on where we are in our parameter space. Um, so this plot here shows the different cases that I talked about. So for example, the kind of the, the heavier binary black hole cases uh, over here, this blue box, uh, the lighter BNS cases down here. And there are two numbers on top of the, the box here. So uh, this number is the ROQ time. So in hours, so 6.7 hours. And this is the time it would take using the full likelihood. So roughly 53. Certainly the most dramatic speed ups we get are for the BNS cases. So it took about 12 hours uh, versus what would have been a little over 3000 uh, hours. Uh, so the speed ups are in the order of hundreds uh, in, for these lighter systems. Um, okay, so yes, running uh, late on time here. So just a quick, there's only two slides left. Uh, one is to point out extensions of this, this method to uh, tests of GR. Uh, so that was done in 2018. Uh, this is just a snapshot of the training set. So uh, the way this training set was constructed was to take all of the basis functions that were found for Phenom PV2 and in each one of the testing, so in these testing GR kind of scenarios, you have various parameters that you can vary. Uh, there are 15 in total and a different reduced order quadrature is built uh, for each one by kind of tensor producting the initial training set with this one extra dimension that we're allowing for. Uh, in this case, it's uh, phi three. Uh, so you can kind of see what the training set looks like. Uh, again, an end-to-end -end PE run shows that the results are, are consistent and the speed up factors are somewhat similar to the ones for the uh, Phenom PV2, uh, roughly from three to 100 and 130 for BNS type signals. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic speed up uh, was found by Rory Smith just this past year, um, looking at 3G detectors. So for example, uh, in this mock kind of test case, uh, we had, uh, there were three detectors, Cosmic Explorer, Cosmic Explorer South and Einstein Telescope. And the signal model we were looking at was IMR Phenom PV2 with tidal corrections. Um, so a reduced order quadrature rule had to be built for this model and these detectors, which uh, took a long time. And a uh, fiducial signal was, was injected into um, mock data. So this is a BNS event at a very high SNR, 2,400. Um, and the ROQ run, so this is a case where it's probably good to combine different methods. So it was using parallel Bilby uh, with the dynasty nested sampler that's built in. And the ROQ run took about 10 hours uh, on 10 nodes with 160 cores per, per node. So some high performance computing resources were used here, uh, but it was accomplishable within a 10 hour time frame. Um, the time it takes to compute a likelihood without ROQs is roughly 10 to the four times larger. So this would have taken 11 years if ROQs were not used in this case. Um, so this is a dramatic example of a scenario where you, you probably couldn't do this otherwise. Uh, at least not the full Bayesian case without some acceleration techniques like ROQs. Um, okay, so I think I'm pretty much uh, done. And uh, just a quick summary of, of where things stand. So um, 
as Stephen also pointed out, and I think many others have, uh, it, there's no shortage of uh, ideas and approaches we need to take for fast inference uh, because detectors are getting better, the SNRs are going up, so we're seeing more signals at higher SNRs, uh, the durations of the signals will become longer. Um, so this is one specific, a targeted approach for this. Um, so it's data specific quadrature rule. Uh, it works for complicated models, higher harmonic modes. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the signal ahead of time. So you don't have to know where best fit parameters are. You can just use your sampler sort of out of the box. Uh, we have error bounds that are computable. And a lot of work has been done over the past few years to uh, write codes that can build reduced order quadratures. Um, and we talked a little bit about the, the speed ups that can be achieved. So coming to the outlook and limitations and things that we would like going forward. Um, so one is we would always like more compact quadrature rules. So even though we're computing likelihoods on the order hours, uh, low latency sky maps would, would need, if you wanted to do a full Bayesian approach, would need to be even faster. So that may require even more compact quadrature rules. Um, a practical limitation is that it takes a lot of person hours to build it. I mean, even though the codes are there, uh, kind of babysitting them, going back and checking that things work is a significant investment in one's time. Um, so as new models come out, as they always do, one always has to rebuild ROQ rules, which means that they're always running a bit behind by a couple of years, uh, which makes it somewhat hard to use the ROQs for production runs because we'd always like to have them ready for the best available models. Uh, so kind of automating this would be very helpful, I think. And um, there are things that would be nice on the wish list, so time domain models. So that everything I've talked about right now is only for frequency domain models. Um, it would be great to find ways of applying similar strategies to work for, for time domain models. Um, okay, I think that's it. Thank you.